Hi everyone, welcome back to AI News. <laughs> this is Ethan. This is Felicia. Yeah, today we're in an interview with another candidate. We met him at uh, Northern California. Yes. Uh, the last time we went there, it was a great meeting, and he came to us tell us that he is running because California needs some fixing. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, today we have what's your name, sir? Washing Ma Alan Morrison. 非常感谢你们邀请我来参加爱报道的访谈。我觉得十分幸运。啊，我呃，自我介绍一下，我住加州的 Palo Alto。我和我太太结婚三十五年了，我们有两个孩子，大的三十二岁，小的三十岁。我是律师。我在呃西雅图、纽约、台北、北京，呃，都工作过。呃，我住了台北七年，在这里结婚生子，然后我们呢、呃、一家都住过北京五年半。其实我讲中文呃不会讲的太好，所以下来呃。我们用英文来说比较好。啊啊啊！太可以了，不是？我觉得就是他一个最大的特点，就是他很谦卑。对啊，他说他中文不太好。<笑><笑>你中文非常好，你啊，你过奖过奖。哇哦哇哦哇哦 ！Yeah， okay. so you you do learn a lot Chinese. During the time that you live in Taipei, and he's from Taipei, he's Taiwanese. Yeah, I'm Chinese. He's Taiwanese. Okay, very good. Chinese from which city? Dongbei. Ah, I'm from Dongbei. Dongbei. Oh, okay. Shenyang, uh, uh, Changchun. Yeah, Shenyang. How the how the. So, just、uh, by way of background, talking about spiritual development, I. Came from a Christian family.、Um, I have actually a grandparents who were missionaries, an older sister who's a missionary. I grew up in the church, but turned away from the church. I went to a very liberal college, and、uh, you know, turned away. Actually, turned toward Buddhism. Went to graduate school in Tibetan languages and religion for a while. But you know, personal life problems. I turned back to Jesus, and He led me to apply to law school. So I was accepted and、uh, studied for three years, and then decided to leverage two years of Chinese I'd taken to study Chinese in Taipei with the Stanford Center. Stanford University had a language center then. I lived there seven years. The first year studied Chinese, and then got a job with a local law firm.、Uh, you know, it was a very good life. Taiwan's economy was really taking off at that time. And、uh, paid well. I had a good time. The food in Taiwan is great.、Right? But、uh, I also found my wife. Got married. We had our child there. Then I decided I wanted to advance my career. So we moved to New York and went to Columbia University. Got an advanced law degree, and then got hired by the largest law firm in the world.、Uh, after working with them about a year in New York, they sent me to Beijing、uh, because I could speak Chinese. So that was a very interesting time. Uh, as you know, the Cultural Revolution had unfortunately done severe damage to China, and my job was going around, taking U.S. or European partners to go around to remote towns like Jiangsu up north near the Russian border, Jinan on the、uh, on the Yellow River, Xi'an, and、uh, I was the foreign attorney attending. There would be a Chinese side, a foreign side, and we negotiate. It was very good. It really helped China's development in the long run, I think. But it also gave me a chance to see the state-owned enterprises, how people were living at that time. You know, it's quite different in China now. It's China economically has advanced very much, but at that time, it was still pretty grim in in、uh, especially in the remote areas of China.、Um, it was a very challenging time because you know I was in a foreign country. To be honest, my Chinese was not very good at that time. But sometimes I was the only person who spoke both Chinese and English, so I was also the translator as well as the lawyer. And all of this time, we had two children by then, young children in Beijing. Overall, though, life was quite good. I liked it there. I liked the people. I liked the environment. But God had other plans. 
I came down with a cancer in 1995 and it was called lymphoma. Uh, it was a uh, it was a shock. I had actually flown to Beijing to get what I thought was a operation for a hernia. And the doctor woke me up on the table as I was under sedation and said to me, do you know your lymph nodes are all swollen? I, I didn't, of course. Long story short, I was able to work another four years. It was a very slow growing cancer, uh, worked in, in uh, Beijing. And then the law firm I was working for fortunately had an office in Palo Alto in California near Stanford University, which is one of the leading centers in the world for treating this kind of disease. So we moved to Palo Alto, my wife, my kids, uh, and we've lived here since. It was a challenge. I, I mean, I don't want to take too long with this, but what happened was the disease, although it had been very indolent, they call it, very slow growing, it started advancing. It started growing faster than the chemotherapy they gave me could kill it. So in other words, the beginning of the month, I'd take chemotherapy, the tumors, which were in my face and neck by then, would decrease in size. And at the end of the month, they'd be bigger than at the beginning. So the doctor said, you know, you're going to die unless you get a transplant, a bone marrow transplant. That's where they kill your bone marrow and give you the, the marrow back from yourself or somebody else. So I decided to do that. After research, though, I found that the program at Stanford Five to 10% of the people who went through it died in the first 90 days. You know, I had young children, a family. This, by the way, was all the time was bringing me much closer to God. I mean, God doesn't cause disease. So God uses this, I think, to bring us closer together. So, for example, my wife had come from a Buddhist family. She did go to church with me every Sunday. We went to a Presbyterian church in Taipei. And then when this all happened, after we moved to Palo Alto, we found a church, the Menlo Church, and she became part of a group called Mothers Together. They led her to Jesus. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. That was a real blessing. And another thing that happened is, you know, I'm a competent person, right? I've always relied on myself and felt I could do everything. Well, this disease was a way that God showed me that he's in charge. We can do our best, but the result is his. We give it to him, you know, Unless God watches the, the city, the watchman watches in vain, right? I mean, we have to depend on him. As far as the disease went, it was very harsh. I actually was injected with radioactive molecules, and I was in an isolated room for eight days because I was too radioactive for anybody else to come near me. Following that, I had 10 days when everything collapsed inside my mouth and throat, and I couldn't eat, so I had to get a tube to feed. But I did recover, and my you know, I was blessed with a wife and children who supported me all this time, who moved up to Seattle and lived with me as I went through this. Uh, you know, I, it's just, God is so good. Recovered four years. Okay. Happened again. It came back. My leg actually broke from it. They gave me, uh, healed the leg, gave me another transplant. That was 2008. And praise God, I've been free of the disease since 2008. But it was a real lesson going through that. I mean, uh, as to uh, how to depend on God. So after I went back to work, I actually went out on my own. I left the firm in 2011. And, you know, I don't know if you've been on your own on business, but that also is a kind of challenge, a way that God brought me closer to him. Because you work for a firm and you get a paycheck every month, right? Uh, it just happens. Of course, you have to do a good job. But when you're on your own, you don't know if you're going to have any income two months from now or three months from now. So it was another real lesson to... I think God, you know, sometimes he keeps telling us the same thing over and over again because we don't get it, right? But it was a lesson to rely on him. And, you know, it's, I haven't gotten rich, but it's been successful. He's been with me and with the business for the last 10 years. So that's good. And then I also wanted to talk just a bit about the church because the Menlo Church, where I go to church, has been very supportive. I became part of a group. 15, 16 years ago, of about 40 people, we pray for each other, we have someone read the Bible, and we study it each week. It's been such a blessing to have that and such a support. I've also volunteered starting 12 years ago with City Team. Uh, they're a Christian long-term recovery program for people who are addicted to very dr drugs, alcohol. But most of the guys I work with, I talk to them as a spiritual mentor one-on-one, -on -one, for one hour a week, sometimes I have two or three guys, but whatever, it's one to three hours a week and just talk about their lives, you know, and help them because they're going through a 12 step program. And, and the real blessing of it is most of them succeed, not everyone, 
But these are guys, a lot of them come out of Monterey County, for example, Hispanic background. They've been in gangs, they've committed crimes. You know, we don't talk about it, but I'm sure some of the crimes were serious. Uh, they've been addicted. Over half of them, I would say, have baby mamas, right? I mean, that's the society now. That's what's happened through years of bad policy. They have children. They're not married to the women. Sometimes they have more than, you know, one uh, woman they've been with. One of the blessings also in this program is that I see guys in their late 20s and 30s, you know, they've done these things. And one of the strongest motivations, not the only one, but one of the strongest ones is they have kids and they can't be with them. And God gives us that tie between parent and child. It's with us all our life. I mean, I'm old now, right? But my children are still my children, no matter what happens. And it's true for these guys too. And so a um, strong motivation to stop the drugs, stop the alcohol, get their lives in order, get a job is because then they can have a relationship with their children again. That's a very strong motivation and it's a blessing to see. The other thing that's happened is I feel our, our government, especially our state government is just on the wrong track. You know, I mean, God is not involved there. Of course, there are some godly people in the government, but not so many. <laughs> And there's policies that come out. I guess the ones that finally just made me feel I had to do something, a lot of what I call anti-parent bills in the last summer and in up to through September, most of them have become laws, unfortunately, but they do things like split up families, uh, you know, take children away if uh, the parents won't affirm their gender choices. They hide gender choices from parents. And beyond that, they also criminalize parents who try to protest. I mean, I was in China. I talked to people. I saw people who had been, you know, been through the Cultural Revolution. It's frightening how similar what our California state government, our legislature is doing to what Mao Zedong and, you know, the Red Guard and, and the Cultural Revolution did to China. You were there during the Cultural Revolution? No, but I saw the aftermath and talked to oh, okay. the people who'd been through it. So the Cultural Revolution ended, what, 1966, and I was there in uh -huh. 1995. So the people in their middle age and older, many of them had gone through the Cultural Revolution. Wow. Uh, actually, many of them had their lives damaged. And even if they survived, we had a helper, someone, a woman we hired to help with our children, extremely bright woman. But because of the Cultural Revolution, she'd been sent to Inner Mongolia to work on a pig farm for 12 years. Now, that's okay. That's honorable work. But I mean, she could have been so much more. She could have gone to university. She could have been a doctor, a lawyer, a leader of some kind. But instead, you know, she had a child and she was alone and she just had this farming work as experience. I mean, there's experiences over and over again. I uh, heard from people who whose lives had been, you know, damaged by that. And some who'd come through very well. I had a colleague, went through the Cultural Revolution, was sent as a youth out to study from the peasants, right? Taken in a truck with a lot, with a number of other college students and dumped in a village in Dombe, actually. And uh, just told, go to learn from the peasants. Uh, no, not given anything. And, you know, they did. They actually were able, I mean, the peasants helped them, but it was a very tough life. They had to build their own shelter. They had to survive. My friend, extremely bright guy, not only survived, but as the Cultural Revolution end, he just went back to Beijing. He somehow got back into high school to try and finish. And he was so good. He, he came at languages. He came to the attention of the United Nations and they hired him and he became a translator. He spoke English uh, very fluently in his years with the, the United Nations. He also learned French. He also went to law school and, uh, you know, had, was working with the firm I was with in New York. So there's success stories that come out of it too, but it's it was a very difficult time. I'm sure you must have others who talked about the challenges, problems that were caused by the Cultural Revolution and the challenges in overcoming them. That is a very interesting perspective because yeah. I never talked to anyone who actually been through it and see all these. Yeah, many people, they don't believe, even though like Chinese people who live in the United States and people always yell and say, hey, look, it's exactly what happened in China. But people don't get it. Even though like maybe Chinese people, they don't know what's happening in the States and they don't relate it to the history from China. And the American people, they don't know the Chinese history and they have no idea how to relate that. But you are the only one that we met. You've seen both sides and you can see that's exactly happened in the U.S. 
And there's a lot of Christians say that, oh, Christ is a socialist, the early church is a socialist, and there are actually pastor and teaching on that. And when I saw it, I'm just like, dude, that is not Christian at all. What are your thoughts on that? Mm. When you, after you've seen it and seen what socialism is, like communism is like, and then come back to the States? Well, I think, you know, I, I, just one more experience I wanted to relate to you, and that is a friend who's actually living in, in the Bay Area now, who as a child, she's older, as a child walking to school, she saw, saw people lined up and shot. It, it was very traumatic for a lot of people. But with regard to communism and socialism, I think one way to look at it, if you, if you look at history, Marx based his philosophy on Hegel. Hegel was nominally a Christian, but he came up with this idea of the dialectic that, you know, shaped history. And what Marx said is, this dialectic is the right thing. This is how things happen. But we don't need God, right? I mean, Hegel still believed in God. We don't need God. Somehow the classes are going to create this paradise even without God. So it's in a way, it's a kind of Christian heresy. You can look at both the former Soviet Union and China, the Communist Party in China, as Christian heresies. It's what happens when people decide they can do things on their own, on their own power, and, and deny God. And I think one way to look at it is if you look at the Bible, like in Acts, where they talk about the early church, you know, they did live in a kind of socialist, communist way, sharing everything in common. But the key issue there, the key point is this. If you do that voluntarily, and we do have people still do it today, the Mennonites, for example, that's from God. If you force people to do it, that's from Satan. That's communism. That's what Russia, that's what China is. It's when you say, no, if you want to give up your time, your energy, if you want to give to others, that's from God. If you want to force other people to do it, that's just slavery. That's just a form of slavery. That's all it is. It can be very comfortable. You know, I mean, I think there's many people in China right now live very comfortable lives. I still work every week, every month with colleagues in China, and they generally support the government. Although with COVID, I think that tried everybody. They, you know, the, the isolation and locking people up and not letting them go out for food. I think that that really damaged uh, the credibility of the Communist Party, even among supporters over there. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that a lot of Americans, especially young people, are so ignorant about this communist idea. From my personal viewpoint, it's like communism is the modern day Tower of Babel. We're doing it in our name. We want to put our name in the sky. We want to be God. And I think what you've been through, it's something that a lot of us, and Christian need to think about, especially in your area and in our area mm. too. We are voting not with our value, but with a lot of time with our race, with our ethnicity. All we want is free stuff from the government. Basically, that's what we're voting into. Is that why you decided to, you want to run because of your Christian value and you see that- uh, Happening yeah, in that, the US. Yeah. Indeed, yes. I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't really want to run, but I felt called to. <laughs> I felt called to, and I think that's exactly right. I think with Christian values, they're not socialism. I mean, I know there's liberation theology and, and people who try to use Christianity to put in place socialist policies. But if you really look at what Jesus is saying, he's talking to us as individuals. He's not talking about trying to, you know, socialists, communists, but even socialists are trying to put in place some kind of paradise on earth. So yes, we need to do things to improve. We need to have laws to protect people and to control society. There's a very famous, I don't know if you know, but if you've read the uh, Brave New World, very famous science fiction future novel uh, written back in the 1900s. I used to, we, everyone had to read it in high school, but the introduction to that says, our problem in the future may not be how to achieve a utopia, but how to avoid one. Uh, you know, those people that want to, to get us into a utopia often end up putting us in a kind of hell, to be honest. I mean, just look at places like Venezuela. I spent a couple of weeks in Zimbabwe. Um, that's a place where, gosh, uh, God is present. People are very religious, but 
they have really adopted the idea of socialism and it's led them to a situation where they have something like 80 percent unemployment it's crazy 80 percent <laughs> unemployment yeah. so a lot of people live on the land they grow their own vegetables so you know they live they manage to get by but it's a very poor country and it doesn't have to be that way they have tremendous natural resources they could be a rich country they have a large <laughs> underground economy so it, they, they don't a lot of them don't pay taxes but and so what they do is they'll sell things on the street or you know they, they just don't do things that come to the so in a way it's a good life but in another way it's not because everyone's poor right i mean they don't have yeah. much they just have to scramble to get by mm. uh, i think we could live with a lot less government and have a wealthy society it's just yes. that's not happening there yeah i think they're forcing yeah to live in that kind of life it's not the truth like if you have a free society, wealthy society, you can choose to be like that, but they're forcing mm. down to be like that. Mm. So that's not a good thing. Okay. That's yeah. a consequence of the socialism. Well, what are your messages to churches around the election time? And yeah. uh, how, what's your plan to empower Christians to vote again and to take control of California? You know, that's again? a very difficult, uh, sit that's a very difficult question. So I think, there are conservative churches who follow more conservative policies and go back to the Bible, I think. But there are many churches, and they mean well, uh, who, uh, I don't know how you would say it, they look at policies like, you know, helping people, they think it's helping people out, you know, giving food to people on the streets and, and drugs, even giving things away free. And in fact, what that really does, I, I guess the analogy is like this. If you're a parent, and you raise a child, if you love that child, uh, what you'll do is often you'll support them and help them grow. But if they're doing something wrong, if they're doing something they need, need to be corrected, you correct them. And you're going to be the bad guy, right? If you tell them you can't do this, you can't date that guy, right? You can't do these kind of drugs. You can't go to that party. Parents don't want to be the bad guy, right? They want to be the good guy. They want to be the one who is liked and loved. But in reality, if they really love their kids, they're going to do that. They're going to let themselves be the bad guy, right? And I think that's what we need to do in our politics and in our churches. I think there's a lot of churches that really need to rethink. And, and I think they are now because we're seeing the consequences of, you know, through higher in California, of these kind of policies through higher crime, through homelessness, through the, the you know, the problems with the parents and, and the children in school. So I think it's finally opening up people to realize that, Yes, you need to be firm as well as loving. You need love above all love, right? You need to really see other people and encounter them, see them as they are. But it's not wrong to deny somebody who's begging on the street if you know or have a good idea that they're going to take that money and go get drunk with it. I mean, that's not a wrong thing. And we need to learn how to do that more. And I think right now, uh, not only in our lives, but in politics, and I think right now, uh, many people are so disgusted with what's happening in Sacramento that they're willing to hear that message. I went with a group of mothers to testify before a Senate committee and uh, about, you know, these parent bills, one of them that was going through. And these mothers were showing me books that they'd taken out of school that, you know, shouldn't be even in an ordinary library. They were they were <laughs> pornography. You know? and yeah, I've seen those books. <laughs> Those mothers were so, the, the thing, the key point though, those mothers were so concerned. I mean, these are their children. These are their lives. They're there to talk to the senator. And this Senate committee were sitting up there. They had a lot of bills to go through. Okay, a lot of work, but they're just joking. Sure. They actually started playing Jeopardy with each other. The problem is not so much the people who support these bills, but that most of the people in Sacramento now just don't care. These kind of issues are throwaway issues to them. They want to serve the special interests who elected them. And, you know, parents are concerned about these kind of anti-parent bills, but there's groups that support them that also have support to pass special interests. And legislators will say, look, okay, I don't care about this issue that much. I'll give it, I'll give you my vote. I'll vote for this anti-parent bill, right? I think we need people, and this is why I decided to stand up. It's so easy to to get into the legislature, to get into that game. I'm a conservative voice. I'm going to always be a conservative voice. You know, I've been through some tough times and I've got kids I worried about and hopefully grandkids someday. 
I am going to go to the legislature and stand up and, you know, I'm not alone. There are other legislators, small minority, but there are other, other legislators who are standing up. We need a wave of us. And there are a wave. I think you may have interviewed some of the other candidates who are also doing the same thing. The time has now come when we really need, you know, not to just go along, not to just vote for candidates who sound good or who promise us benefits, but candidates will really stand up for values. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is a very strong message. And I encourage everyone to look you up. Alan Marson. I'm running for Assembly District 23. That's in the Bay Area, includes the north part of Santa Clara and the south part of San Mateo counties. AD23, I have a site. It's called uh, AD23 at alankmarson.com. Please look it up. Um, be happy for your support and, uh, you know, happy to talk with you if you have questions. How can they be with your volunteer and uh, or how, how can they donate to your campaign? Thank you so much. Uh, if you go on to the website, there are contact forms, volunteer forms, a contribution button. So please do. Uh, it's actually the way the system is set up. It's very expensive to run. Uh, it's going to be roughly $9,000 just to get a 250 message word on the ballot. So any contribution is is helpful and appreciated, not just for me, but for any conservative candidate, the ones running in your district, you know, I'd urge people to get to know them and to help and to contribute if they can. The next episode, we will focus on his policy. So stay tuned. Thank you guys for watching. And my name is Ethan. And this is Felicia. And can you tell us your name again and uh, which district you're running for? So I'm Alan Marson. I'm running for Assembly District. 23, that includes the south part of San Mateo and the north part of Santa Clara County and the coast. And I have a website at Alan, uh, at AD23, Alan, at alanmarson.com. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.